Welcome to the Daily Brief on Metro Milwaukee's health and the economy. My name is Tim Sheehy. I'm president of the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce. Uh, and joining me is our co-host, Dr. John Raymond, president of the Medical College of Wisconsin. Each day at 3.30, we deliver a 19-minute fact-filled update on the health and economic impacts of COVID-19. This webcast is powered by Aurora WDC. And today we're joined by Keith Stanley, the executive director of the Near West Side Partners, whose goal is to build a thriving business and residential corridor through economic development, housing, and safety. Keith, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And now we'll start uh, with our health update and some new data from Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. As you know, over the last three weeks, We've been tracking the efforts of Wisconsin and the Milwaukee region to flatten the COVID-19 curve, and we've seen steady improvement in that the daily growth rate of new COVID-19 cases and the calculated doubling rate have continued to improve, and that trend continues today. There were 52 new COVID-19 positive tests in Milwaukee and 127 in Wisconsin. The daily growth rates improved to about 8.2% in both Milwaukee and Wisconsin. And three weeks ago, the growth rate was nearly 35%. The doubling times also improved again to about 8.46 days in Milwaukee and 8.15 days in Wisconsin. And recall that three weeks ago, the doubling rate was faster than every three days. So we continue to flatten the curve, which is promising news. But I do have a couple of cautionary notes to consider. I know that at least one of our health systems saw a spike in COVID-19 admissions today and that they're at their highest COVID-19 census thus far. And consistent with that observation, the aggregated census of COVID-19 positive patients in southeastern Wisconsin rose today by 13 patients to a total of 350 inpatients. We also know that the census of COVID-19 patients in intensive care units also rose slightly to 131. Now, the other cautionary note is that we still don't know whether there'll be an impact of in-person voting last week or relaxation of social distancing over this past religious holiday weekend. Next slide, please, Austin. Now, many of you have been asking about hospital capacity initially because one of our goals was to flatten the curve so that we could avoid a surge of COVID-19 cases that would overwhelm our health system's capacity to take care of people who needed to be hospitalized or to have intensive care. The hospitals took extraordinary measures to create a significant amount of internal surge capacity to do their part. Now, for those of you who joined the brief yesterday, you know that there's an additional reason for tracking hospital capacity. We proposed a list of five health and safety indicators that would need to be followed as we begin to discuss when and how to do a smart restart for sectors of our economy. And one of those was hospital capacity especially ICU beds and ventilators. Specifically, our indicator reads as follows, quote, that hospitals have the ability to treat all patients requiring hospitalization without resorting to crisis standards, end quote. Now this slide shows data reported as of this morning on total beds and ICU beds in Southeastern Wisconsin. And the data are derived from Wisconsin Healthcare Emergency Readiness Coalition Region 7 or HERC 7 which encompasses Southeastern Wisconsin. And as you can see in the right-hand column, there are over a thousand open and available non-ICU beds in Southeastern Wisconsin and 222 available ICU beds. Now this number of ICU beds might include some surge beds, but the most important takeaway is that we've not exceeded the capacity of our ICU beds up to this date. Next slide, please, Austin. This next slide shows ventilator capacity. Whereas it's clear that we've not exceeded our capacity, I do believe that some of the capacity is surge capacity from ventilators that were repurposed from operating in other procedure rooms. Nevertheless, the punchline is that we have not exceeded ventilator capacity as of today. Next slide, please, Austin. Another health and safety indicator that we proposed yesterday is that we will, quote, have adequate personal, personal protective equipment for healthcare providers, first responders, and employees of economic sectors that begin to open up, end quote. Now, this is a crude metric that needs to be refined, but it's clear from this slide that many of our hospitals in southeastern Wisconsin 
do not have a seven day supply of either N95 masks or face shields available. And a seven day supply is usually the minimum acceptable supply under normal circumstances. So we're gonna to have to dive a little bit more deeply into this metric as we go forward. Next slide, please. And this last slide is just a screenshot pulled from the IHME website, which many of you are following, which shows a projection that we have reached our peak ventilator use here in Wisconsin. Now, again, I urge some caution until we see the impact of relaxed social distancing this past weekend, but in general, the trends are positive. So in summary, we've begun to pivot our thinking and our metrics to those that are relevating to consolidating the process that we've made using social distancing with an eye toward a phased, thoughtful, data-informed restart of our economy in a sector-specific manner informed by our health and safety indicators. Again, I want to thank all of you in the audience for everything that you've done to help us bend down the curve, and I'll turn it back over to Tim. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. And as we bring Keith back in uh, to talk to him a little bit about what's going on in the near west side neighborhood, uh, I'd note, Dr. Raymond, this is the first time that you've used actual hospital data, PPE data, and ICU data from the region in Wisconsin. And this is really helpful, uh, I think, to give us a real time look at where we are as we start to look at re-engaging the economy. Yeah, agree, Tim, and I'm very excited that we have that data available to us now. Well, Keith, again, thank you for joining us, and uh, we've been trying to mix in different perspectives here uh, as we look at the, the healthcare challenges facing the region, uh, and so I'm very interested in your perspective uh, from uh, the near west side what you're seeing with the businesses, what you're seeing with the residents, um, and some of the concerns that you have. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Keith Stanley, I'm the executive director of the Near West Side Partners, I'm also the bid manager for bid number 10, um, Main Street manager. Also, uh, some time ago, worked at City Hall as a chief of staff for Alderman Willie Hines. Uh, uh, graduated from Alabama State in the 40 under 40 for 2016. I don't look that 40 under 40, but I'm, I'm there. Um, I'm gonna dive in. I have a couple of just slides to share with you and I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly so we can get jumping right into Q&A. Next slide, please. Uh, Near Westside Partners, for those of you who are not aware of the Near Westside Partners, we were founded in 2014. Our founding anchors are Aurora Healthcare, Carly Davidson, Marquette University, Molson Coors and Potawatomi Business Development. These organizations reside in the Near West Side and have been tremendous uh, as far as support financially uh, and otherwise as far as work we're doing in the Near West Side. Next slide, please. So as far as our response, I want to talk about the Near West Side and how our organization is responding. We've been able to work with a number of different groups, Associated Bank, LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation to provide grants to help people stay in their homes as far as renters. We've given over $10,000 in rental assistance program, another over $7,000 for rent and payroll for businesses. And we're hoping to give out another additional $15,000 in the next 30 days to businesses and to our renters. We're working on the educational front. We wanna slow the spread. We have a unique stencil uh, program where we're gonna be stenciling in front of the numerous uh, multi-units we have in the New Versailles and in front of gas stations and other places to give people the four items about not touching your face, uh, um, washing your hands and all the other things that have been highlighted that we all hear about. We need that get to that get that information to a specific group and we're doing that. We're doing business safety checks and outreach to all our 370 businesses in the near west side. Many of them are closed. We have a few that's open, but many are closed. And we're partnering with a number of different organizations, Advocate World Health, the Housing Authority, and local businesses for donation and education. Next slide, please. Another uh, uh, part of the response is really our businesses, and our businesses have stood up and really done an amazing job. Central Standard Distillery has turned their liquor, if I can say, into sanitizer. We've been able to get that out to a number of our housing uh, facilities and those who are our most vulnerable population. We're also, a lot of our business have cut, as many of us have, cut the hours in half, even laid off staff. Many we've encouraged and we work with them to apply for the SBA loan, SBA loan and the uh, payroll protection program. Some of our businesses who are open, they're doing the curbside service, Trickle Tresiclo Peru, Five O'Clock Steakhouse and Pete's Pop are other smaller businesses who are open do the curbside service. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the resident challenge, and this is where it's difficult. We're dealing with a population a little bit less educated, um, a lot of hourly workers. That slow to spread education is important. And even though many of us have gotten that message, many of our residents haven't. They live in a lot of multi-units. There's still a lot of activity going on. We've had conversations with our, with our police department, Captain Jeffrey Norman and others. And so we're gonna be working to use more graphics, more videos to keep the message simple about slowing the spread. We're also gonna be working with our landlords and businesses so they understand the policies to keep people safe. We have a definitely concern with fresh food access as we see these supply chains being affected across this country and across the world. Getting fresh food to these communities is really difficult at this time. It's not just about people not having money. It's about making sure they can shop safely for the food they need. And then also providing clear language on our health education. If people are feeling ill, where do they go? How should they, who should they go to? Is there testing available? A lot of that information is not readily available for the community that we serve. Next slide, please. The city challenges, we know it's important to get back to work and that's what we all want to do. I think there's a message there to be shared. Is the quarantine working? Has it worked? I think many people are unaware if it's having an effect um, that concerns them. What are the clear ways in government, where are the clear ways government and business continue to keep frontline workers safe? Many of our people are still deemed essential who work in the near west side, they're the grocery store clerks, they're the tellers, they're safety and security personnel, and they're concerned about their safety. We want to make sure that we have a message that we're not putting profits before people. So we want to make sure there's an outline of what people can expect, even though we're all in this together and a lot of things can't be answered. But what can we share with our com community, including our businesses and our residents, about what to expect for the next two weeks, 30 days, six months out? Next slide, please. And then urban opportunities. We're hoping that we can be able to work with our anchor institutions and others to make sure that we can work with minority owned businesses who provide protective equipment and who provide professional cleaning services, decontamination services. So we're pretty excited about some of these opportunities. Thank you, Jim. That's what yeah, I Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Keith, for working through that. And we'll bring Dr. Raymond in here and um, answer some of our questions from the audience. But the question I have for you, Keith, is. Uh, one of the last points you made that's uh, challenging for everybody, and that is giving folks a clear line of sight about what's coming next. Um, how safe are they? And as you know, businesses start to come back online, I think people want to know what the next couple of weeks look like. So um, what, what do you think um, can be done to help uh, folks in your community understand that better? I will say this, I've been following a lot. There's uh, Richard Florida who wrote the book, Creative Class and the New Urban Crisis, an amazing guy, Richard Florida. He said some things I think are important. We need to give some tools specifically to our businesses on how they can begin to open up slowly and whatever that is, it may not be next two weeks, but if we can have a clear, this is what you should do if you're a, if you're a, you know, a, 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 a eye doctor or if you're a, a veterinarian clinic, a lot of our businesses, they need the information. So, okay, this is how I can keep my patrons safe, uh, whether it's tools or packets, guidelines, even our landlords. So I think for us is getting the information that allows people to slowly open back up to make sure that when people are coming to get to support the business, they know that they're safe. Well, that's a great point, and we're, we've been working with the medical college, um, and we expect uh, Keith to have guidelines, uh, best practices, if you will, for companies uh, as they reopen to make sure that both their customers and their employees are safe, and we share that information amongst employers. So that's a that's a great point. Um, Chris, do we have questions? We do. The first one is for Dr. Raymond and Tim. You may want to weigh in on this one as well. We had a question about some of the multi-state coalitions that they're forming among governors, both in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest. Would there be an advantage to having a Great Lakes version of that? And how would that help? Well, I'll start and then let Dr. Raymond chime in. I, I think there would be an advantage to that. Um, I believe Governor Evers is in touch with uh, the surrounding governors. And I think as Dr. Raymond has pointed out and just anybody knows from their own life experience, uh, you're traveling in between states um, and we have to have some clarity uh, as to where each state is uh, in the process. Uh, so we're, we're not cross-contaminating states. Um, and that's going to be a, a difficult challenge, but a necessary one. Dr. Raymond? Yeah, great idea. I would say it's essential to our success. Another question for Dr. Raymond and, and Keith. I don't know if this issue has come up among your residents that you've heard, but uh, parents who have joint custody of a child wonder if it's safe for that child to go back and forth between households. Does Would that increase their risk or potentially the risk of the families as well? 
I, w I would say, Dr. Raymond, uh, my thought, I wouldn't say that directly, but I would say you will hear, with, especially with an African-American community, there's this increase as far as the COVID deaths and the virus. A lot of that is due to intergenerational living. We see that quite a bit in our community, grandma, mother, and people going back and forth. That's been difficult as we try to figure out how to slow the spread. I will share that. Yeah, I think that's really an outstanding point, Keith. And, um, you know, there are just some circumstances in which you you can't avoid interacting with your family. And I would say having uh, joint custody of kids might be a case where you've got to make that exception. Mm -hmm. Another question we had uh, from a business owner was, how, would, how do you factor in allowing a recovered COVID-19 patient back to work for an essential business that's operating right now? That's a good question. And we hope to be learning soon whether people that are recovered actually are immune to a secondary infection. And that's the big variable that we don't know. And I'm sure people are aware that there are some reports from South Korea that there are patients who had COVID-19, tested negative, and then tested positive again. We don't know whether that's a reinfection or a relapse. That's gonna be very, very important. We just don't know right now, but I think all of us hope and pray that if you have a COVID-19 infection and you recover, that you'll be immune and you'll be ready to go back to work. Another question we have is for when we do get to the phase where more businesses can reopen and perhaps testing may or may not be available every business every day, how effective is temperature scanning as sort of a proxy for testing every day? It's better than nothing. And I would say if you look at China, they're using infrared scanners at the entrance to some of their buildings. Uh, they have drones with temperature scanners that they're using in crowds to identify people. And um, if they're doing it, it must make some sense. One, one last question, Keith, we were wondering how the, uh, the recommendations about using face masks for the general public, do you, do you see that resonating in the community you live in? Yes, we're starting to see quite a bit of that. We actually have partnered with a group to help us get additional face masks uh, for our vulnerable population. We have two housing uh, 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 housing authority complex, uh, public housing complexes in the near west side, and so we're getting face masks. That was really that two weeks ago. That wasn't a thing as much, and we're starting to see a lot more residents take it much more seriously. Even with signs in our businesses is saying that they won't allow people to come in without a face mask. So it's definitely has the, that word has gotten out about the face mask. Great, and thank you to everybody who asked questions today. Yeah, no, that's that's great to hear. Uh, Keith, uh, the Near West Side is lucky to have you as a leader there. And I think you play an important and increasingly important role about spreading the message uh, about uh, what's happening and, and the path forward. So we appreciate that. Dr. Raymond, uh, always a pleasure and appreciate the new data on uh, the hospital capacity. And we'll continue to use that as we mark uh, the path forward. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be joined by Peggy Williams Smith of Visit Milwaukee, on Thursday by Waukesha County Executive Paul Farrow, and on Friday by the mayor as we wrap up the week. So continued good progress, uh, but the caution light is still on. So have a safe afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Keith. Thank you.